The Alaska Cruise and Tour of Vancouver is the venue for the 52nd FEU Medicine Reunion of Class 1961. While Ernie and Hyde took a five-hour bus drive, the rest flew into Seattle for the seven-day Alaska cruise adventure on the Royal Caribbean Rhapsody of the Sea cruise liner starting on August 30th, 2013. We cruised the historic Inside Passage with shore visits to Juno, Skagway, and Ketchikan, then cruised the amazing Tracy Arm Fjord and Sawyer Glacier, disembarking on September 6th for a three-day tour of Vancouver, Canada. Alaska is also referred to as the last frontier, although it is the largest of the 52 states, it is the less densely populated. Oil and natural gas is the major industry which accounts for 25% of the oil production in the US. Fishing and seafood is the second largest private industry employer. Most of the US salmon, crab, halibut and herring come from Alaska. Uh, Tom Bonson, an avid fisherman, knows more about this. Now I find out he sleeps in because I said, you know, we were in the medical mission. Finally, I he sends a YouTube. <laughs> Sali mo po. Sali. Okay. Sali ka. Sali para. He's taking a picture. She's taking a picture.
Uh, Juneau is the capital of Alaska. It is named after Joseph Juneau, a miner and gold prospector who ushered in the gold rush in the 1880s. He helped the city become the hard rock gold capital of the world. Population is about 32,000 but could swell up to about a million due to visitors and tourists between May and September. It is a popular cruise ship destination. It has a spectacular sceneries with picturesque mountains and forests, stunning waterways, magnificent fjords that lie along the coast. Then there is the majestic Mendenhall Glacier, one of 38 glaciers flowing from the massive 1,500 square miles in the Juneau ice field. And downtown Juneau is just a short walk from the waterfront. Good timing on your part. This is definitely our, our favorite time of year at the Half Moon for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. She's asking if those, um, those beach will then take those babies from that roof and transfer them right back out here into those net pens again that I was mentioning earlier. So, um, so then you can kind of see how they complete that cycle here in our country. And uh, this is a year round. Skagway is a gold rush town. It is known as the gateway to the Klondike gold fields. In reference to the famous gold rush to the Yukon Territory in the late 1890s, it is Alaska's gold rush preserve with many buildings still original for over 100 years. It is the sunshine capital of Southeast Alaska as it has only 27 inches of rain or moisture a year. Although the resident population is estimated at only about a little over 900 as of 2012 census, but it swells up to over 700,000 during summer from tourists and various visitors.
But not any soap, mind you. This is a miracle soap. So <laughs> make black and curly. Ma'am, are you a little peachy? His wallet, hands a little bit trembling. Pull out a $5 bill, come up to Soapy Smith. He would snap it out of the man's hand. The man would choose his bar of soap, begin to unwrap. I thought he would scream! Waving $20 in the air! Screams! The crop can't.
Day 5 is cruising the Tracy Arm Fjord on a round trip inside Passage Cruise to view the spectacular fjords and Sawyer glaciers. The fjords have magnificent steep cliff, often covered with last trees and shrubs, with waterfalls intermittently plunging into the waters of the fjords below. The mountain peaks form its backdrop. The Tracy Arm Ford is only 45 miles south of Juneau. At the end of the day, the sunset enriches the ethereal colors of the horizon and sets a serene and even a spiritual mood. Ketchikan, the salmon capital of the world, is located along the Inside Passage in southeastern Alaska, just 500 miles north of Seattle. 
It is the southeasternmost city of Alaska. It is also called the rain capital of Alaska. It has a high amount of rainfall with an average of 153 inches per year, especially during autumn and winter. They call it the liquid sunshine. We were very lucky that we were not met with this rain. The population is about 8,000 based on the 2010 census. There's about a 10.8% Asian population and out of that, 9.4% are Filipinos. So we should feel at home here. Uh, Ketchikan has the world's largest collection of standing totem poles found throughout the city and at four major locations. One of them, the Patlats Park, uh, which we visited. circular face uh, that he's holding on to there in his beak and that is the sun it's a representation of the sun up in the sky and there's a story about that and I'll get to that a little bit later uh, the raven on my right um, there's three men on the top of his head these three men they're called the three watchmen On the front of your house or in front of your village, three watchmen would look after you um, when you slept. And so that's what the three watchmen are for. So we'll move a little bit further down here and talk about this one back here. Well, I mentioned earlier that totem poles were... Uh, another reason was a clan pole or a heraldic pole um, that they would put in front of their village or in front of their house. You know, they'd, they'd carve a, a raven and they put it in front of the village so that when uh, neighboring villages came by, they knew who lived in that particular village. So finally, she asked the eagle um, up at the top to go out and find the husband. And the eagle went out over the sea and saw, spotted him um, stranded on an island. She came back to the woman, told her where her husband was, and she rode on the back of the killer whale out and res rescued her husband. So that's the story behind that. All right, so we'll go ahead and move down. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would spit that out into the bowl of powder, they mix that up and that was paint. Um, it was an, an early oil based paint, it would actually last for quite a long time. Um, it would last 25 to 30 years, um, even though it was getting rained on almost every day, which is just as good as any paint today. Um, some of the oldest totem poles we have um, down in a museum down in Ketchikan uh, that are almost 200 years old, um, originals that haven't been repainted, they still have traces of that original. And you know, it was a lot easier for them to just leave that moss up there. It helped keep the rain out and it did heat, help keep them a little bit warmer as well. And so they would just let that grow out like that. I'm here to talk about some of these other poles.
pull the work out, as well as uh, pretty much ever since I started this one, I've been carving two at once. And this one has always been the, uh, the fall back project. But this fall we'll be getting raised up. So I uh, hope you guys were already informed about traditional paint making methods. Um, kind of we'll use this for shaping and uh, kind of rounding out the figures as well as getting the finishing texture line coatable. Feel free to step on up and uh, give it a touch. You can't hurt it at all with your hands. Um, you'll notice it's extremely smooth. This comes from no sanding and only the use of very sharp tools. And finally, we'll have straight edge knives that we can use for all the uh, cuts on the ears. So uh, it's a little bit difficult finding 500 people who want to help lift uh, three times like the wood up in the air. And what's that? Uh, cranes and heavy machinery nowadays. Traditionally, uh, three to five hundred people. We've got a cart on it, forklift, and take it out and take a walk now. Uh, and finally, we'll put them on the concrete platform. The cedar will actually begin to decay off the inside while it's still alive and growing on the outside. So, a uh, traditional master carpenter will actually walk the around with a cutting board and start working on the cedar and give it a, a smack on the side to kind of play it like a drum. It's sure whether or not it drop the hollow in the center or all the way down. After disembarking from the Royal Caribbean Rhapsody of the Sea cruise line, we are now taking a city tour of Vancouver. Vancouver is a coastal seaport on the mainland of British Columbia Province of Canada. Metropolitan Vancouver has 2.6 million residents, the third largest in Canada. The city population is 600,000 as of 2011, making it the most densely populated city in Canada. In spite of this, it is still considered as one of the world's most livable city, albeit most expensive too. It is one of the most ethnically and linguistically diverse cities in Canada. Its popularity and growth has increased even more 
since hosting the Winter Olympics in 2010. It has many parks and the largest is a Stanley Park at 1,000 acres. City of Granville. And from the city of Granville, this transition became the city of Vancouver. So it was known as Gastown, then the city of Granville, then the city of Vancouver. And it got its name Gastown from the fact that uh, Mr. Dick, by any means, there are two that are larger, uh, one is Toronto and the other is Montreal. Both back east. Uh, they're, uh, everybody's. They got whiskey, women, music, and smoke. That's where all the cowboys go. Now, a lot of the uh, young folks have their weddings over there. St. Paul's Hospital here. St. Paul's Hospital. Now, on the right hand side, as they cross this traffic light, is the Sheridan Mall uh, Center. And all the hotel, the complex is here. And across the street, uh, a couple of lights down here on the left. So you see there's other two large uh, churches that I talked about. One is the uh, Baptist Church and one is the United Church. The United Church is on this side of the intersection on the left. Please, you know. I mean, it's just interesting architecture, that's all. The Hyatt Hotel is up the street. Wine Street is uh, very popular uh, for that purpose. As a matter of fact, they're talking about closing it off again and so they can get this. <laughs> this is the BC Lions, the Canadian Football League, Vancouver White Jones, which is professional soccer. It looks to Big train, they're going to the east and south east to my right. The stadium here, the stadium of Chinatown Station. This is uh, where they go on this side, that is, we pass underneath here. You look in one direction, you'll see the pass, and you look in another, you see the future. The western entrance to our historic Chinatown. This Chinatown is the second largest Chinatown in North America. Second only to that one in San Francisco. Yeah, and most of them are here. This building here to my right, uh, while I have this red light, I'm going to stop here. This is the uh, Jack Chow Insurance Building, where it's two stories tall. Of the very tall, which is one floor. Tunnels underneath all these streets, these tunnels, uh, still in use today. The original use for the tunnels underneath these streets uh, were to house the opiate dens and their brothels, as well as their Fantan parlors. Fantan was an illegal game of chance at that time. To cure. All of these shops open around 10 a.m. in the morning. Uh, they stay open quite late at night. You can buy, in, buy all manner of goods here. Uh, all your uh, dried fruits, vegetables, fresh uh, fish, live fish. Yep. Honoring those fallen soldiers from this area. Yep. As I make, you know, everything that starts down in this area, all of that was purchased by a gentleman who lives here who owns Lululemon, a large sports bar, he said he paid a few million dollars, donated that to the city of Vancouver. West end of Vancouver to my left, you see Milestone, the boathouse, two very popular seafood restaurant here. Yep. English Bay Cafe here to my right. All over the place here. Sam. Trail down here to the right, it's called the Westman Bayshore property. In behind here, you, I don't know if you're right hand side, right? It's called the Anuxia. Now, over to the right as well, across the water, Maritime Museum over there, that is.
Granville Island is a peninsula in a shopping district in Vancouver, BC, located across the Falls Creek from downtown Vancouver City, under the south end of the Granville Street Bridge. The Granville Open Public Market Docks is reminiscent of the Pike Market in Seattle.
the very best, you'll be doing very well. If you're uh, 20 to 7, I would suggest that the uh, uh, Cowboys go to 40 to 5. Wow, look at that. Beautiful. Wow. 
Well, I don't know whether it'd be deserted, but it wouldn't be the metropolis that it is. And you wait till you see it, you'll figure that it's it's quite a place. It actually is quite a place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Oh, they can go. Let them be the test case. Welcome to the island of Victoria. This is Victoria. It is an attractive city and is known as the City of Gardens. It has a population of about 80,000 as of 2006. Healthy family, I love you guys. You are Lura people. How come you have two?
It is one of the oldest cities in the Pacific Northwest. It has retained the several of its historic landmark buildings, such as the British Columbia Parliament and the Majestic Empress Hotel. Other points of interest is the Beacon Hill Park, which has the world's fourth tallest totem pole at 127 feet, curved by Chief Mongo Martin, erected in 1956, which at that time was the world's tallest. Chinatown is the second oldest in North America, next to San Francisco. Black is the first avenue, second avenue. But there's no black as the street. Yeah. Yeah. So did you eat anything there? turn at, at the last turn before you, uh, you get to Butchard Gardens and you wouldn't see very much. This way that I'm going to go, we're going to get to cry, go uh, and buy something. We are now entering the famous Butchard Garden, one of the world's premier floral show gardens. It has the most enchanting scenery I've ever seen. It is located uh, at Brentwood Bay, 14 miles north of Victoria City. It attracts millions of visitors like us every year. It has been designated a National Historic Park in Canada. The garden was started way back in 1907 by Janine and Robert Butcher. In 1909, when the limestone quarry was exhausted, they turned it into a sunken garden. The garden is still family owned and operated. It is currently managed by their great granddaughter, Robin Lee Clark. This 55 acre with over a million plants and floral display was built on an abandoned limestone quarry 
and featuring a stunning sunken garden. Uh, Jinin Butchert, uh, who in 1909 set out to convert the exhausted limestone quarry into the sunken garden. Later, uh, they added the Italian garden, the large rose garden, a picturesque rose fountain, totem poles, the bronze statues of a bear, donkey, toad, and other animals. They also added the kids' pavilion and the rose carousel. This Ross Fountain, with its myriad of patterns, sits in the oldest area of the former quarry. It was named after one of the sons of the Butchard family.
Dann habe ich mich schnell noch einen ähm, eine neuen Boden ausgesucht. Oh, ich werde gut. Ich werde gut. Ich werde gut. The former residence of the Butchard family is now a dining room restaurant. It is built uh, near the Italian garden, which is uh, Jenny Butchard's private garden.
As the sun slowly dips into the horizon, uh, Philip is probably pondering on the illusions of the past, present, and future. One cannot dwell on the past as it is gone. The future is yet to come, but the present is where everything begins and we should live to its fullest potential. All these beautiful things we have had and enjoyed together in the last 10 days is worth remembering. Cheers and God bless to you all. Chimney tops That's where